Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Halton. Hello and welcome to the show, which celebrates a huge birthday here in Germany. Let's have a look at what's coming up on the programme. Wind and water. How Hamburg Harbour celebrated its anniversary. Textiles and technology. A Dutch man designs high-tech fashion. And flora and fauna, the island of Jersey in the English Channel, is nature's paradise. Those with a love for sound and their cars might well consider investing in a state-of-the-art car audio system. A vast range of brands were on display at the high-end fair in Munich this last week, and one of them was the Danish manufacturer Dinaudio. This company specialises in giving their customers the ultimate car audio experience, as long as their pockets are deep enough. When Hans Ulrich Getke listens to music in his car, he hears sounds from speakers made by Danish high-end manufacturer Dynaudio. Sound quality that cost him some 2,700 euros. Car buyers can also get a slimmed down version for around 600 euros. What's interesting is that I can really tell the difference because I drive other cars as well. And the combination of an especially quiet ride and this full transparent sound that Dune Audio gives me is just like a special holiday to me. I drive long distances and it's just more fun to drive this way. Dune Audio in the small town of Skanderborg, Denmark, has been turning out loudspeakers for German car maker Volkswagen for over 10 years now. Much of the work is done by hand. The link to the automotive giant has been a massive boon to the company and its 400 employees. Some 100,000 vehicles per year are rolling off the line with Dune Audio speakers installed. Dunaudio's research and development department pursues the best possible sound quality while dispensing with trendy effects like the booming bass. We have the philosophy of uh, authentic uh, fidelity, which means that we want to reproduce what is put on the record, meaning that whatever source you play, you should hear the source and not everything else. More and more of the world's car makers are collaborating with high-end audio system makers as more car buyers pay more for good sound. Trade magazines estimate that about one in four car buyers take advantage of the option when offered. These speakers provide the benchmark for the sound the Danish engineers aim for in a car. The small, enclosed space of a car presents a challenge, and the solution results in the far higher prices. The space isn't the only obstacle to perfect sound on wheels. The systems have to be light and compact, and they have to overcome loud background noise without overwhelming listeners sitting close to the speakers. Driving a car is very dynamic. You can drive a different speed on highways and on, uh, in cities. And you actually have to, to let the, the radio and amplifier adapt to the environment. Materials, uh, design, positioning of, of the speakers inside the car, that's also what needs to come together in, in, in an optimum compromise. Once the acoustic engineers have pinpointed the ideal balance for 12 high, middle and low frequency speakers in the car, they start fine-tuning the sound. It has to form a harmonious whole for every seat. Even with their sophisticated equipment, in the end, the engineers put their trust in their own ears. You have uh, several tweeters placed around the car, you also have a subwoofer. And we are delaying the tweeters so, and uh, the speakers so they arrive at the same time at the position you are optimizing the sound for. So that the driver in the car will actually feel like they have sitting in a chair listening to, to music like at home. High-end audio for the car. Thousands of music fans are willing to pay extra for the experience.
And now we come to the celebrations. We want to say a huge happy birthday to the Hamburg port, which has just commemorated 825 years of being in operation. The oldest functioning museum ship in the world is called the Cap San Diego. It's usually docked in the Hamburg harbour, but to celebrate their big birthday, the Cap San Diego and other majestic ships and cruise vessels sail down the River Elba for their biggest port festival to date. The port of Hamburg is busier than ever today. Tall ships like the Alexander von Humboldt II sail along smaller vessels. They're here to celebrate the anniversary of the founding of the port more than eight centuries ago. Early on, the museum ship Cap Santiago awaited the arrival of 500 guests. I want to see the ships, but I hope the water stays calm. I don't really have good sea legs. Well, I hope the River Elbe isn't rough. My wife's a little worried. And she's looking forward to the journey home, aren't you? We're the first ship in the parade. I'm looking forward to the other ships lining up, with us at the front. The sail past gets going at 10 a.m. with almost 7,000 tons of steel in motion. However, the Cap San Diego needs help from two tugboats to navigate all of its 160-meter-long hull through the port. It's a special day for Marcus Droste, his first outing as captain of the historic ship. The passengers are allowed onto the bridge to watch him work. The most exciting thing is the ship, which was built to sail long stretches. And now it's tricky maneuvering it out of the small parking space without hitting anything. And that's exciting, and we need guides and tugs, as well as our own engines and steering. It's like a giant toy. The ship travels about 60 kilometers downstream toward the town of Glückstadt. The journey lasts eight hours, but the bad weather means most of the passengers stay below deck. Even down there, there's plenty to see. About 100 crew members are on board to make sure the historic cargo ship remains seaworthy throughout the voyage. Half of them are volunteers. The biggest attraction is the engine room. It's the heart of the ship. The fuel supply is still managed by hand here. On modern ships, it's regulated by computer. People love to be able to come and see us in the engine room. They like to see the old technology up close, and they can only do that with us. Besides, it's pretty warm in here, too. The original radios from 1962 are still here although they've been replaced by satellite technology. Nevertheless, the old timers still work. Radio officer Jutta Landwehr tells the passengers how SOS calls were made earlier using Morse code. It's not an easy task. I don't think anyone could save me using that. I'd have sent a text message from my phone instead. I didn't get it. It's difficult. Learning takes patience and talent, and being a little bit musical helps. The Cap San Diego gives its passengers a glimpse into a bygone age. The library and bar were built back in the 1960s. It used to sail to South America with just 12 passengers and 35 crew members. But nowadays it just takes a few trips down the River Elba every year. Ticket prices start at 130 euros. You can look at everything. You can stand up on the bridge and watch all the maneuvers. You can ask people questions. It's a great atmosphere. I love coming here. It's nice to look out to the water from this big museum ship for the first time. It's fascinating. Really nice and relaxing. I like being on board the Cap San Diego. We're from Bavaria, and it's our first time here. It's great, apart from the weather, of course. 
In the afternoon, the COP San Diego returns in the afternoon to the port of Hamburg, together with 83 other ships. For all the bad weather, the rain could not put a damper on this elegant, historic vessel. Bora Akersdijk is a Dutch designer who's bridging the gap between technology and clothing. Since finishing university, he's been working outside the box and developing his own materials for his fashion collections. He won the Inspiration Award in 2011 and is amongst the first few designers to incorporate technology into his designs. So if you've ever been stuck without Wi-Fi while out and about, then you'll want to hope there is someone in a BB suit nearby. This is his latest invention. This overall is online. The wearer is a walking Wi-Fi hotspot. It might sound like science fiction, but it's high-tech fashion by Bora Akersdijk. The young Dutch designer got the idea for what he's dubbed the BB suit at a music festival. One thing we needed everywhere is Wi-Fi. You need internet. It's like, okay, let's put Wi-Fi inside. Everybody was talking about wearable tech and I didn't really see wearable technology and I thought like, well, if, if I talk about it, I really want to wear it. He said like, okay, now I wanted to make a suit because I, yeah, I'm an, partly a fashion designer. I thought like, yeah, this big jumpsuit, people will recognize and then they will ask like, why do you have this suit? And then you can explain. Go into the Wi-Fi. Then we have the BB suit. Let me talk onto the BB suit. Now the outfit itself is an internet provider. Anyone standing nearby has Wi-Fi reception, and the wearer can be located via GPS. It's a bold idea, but that's what Ackersdijk is known for. Back in 2011, he made waves at Paris Fashion Week with his first collection. Some of the pieces date to 2009 and were part of his final project at the renowned Design Academy Eindhoven. Ackersdijk launched his own label in 2010. He's been able to finance his own designs by collaborating with some big-name labels like Nike and Louis Vuitton. No doubt the young Dutch designer is a visionary. He supplies the ideas and the aesthetics, then he turns to the techies to get help implementing them. We have the different components uh, here. On one side we have the Wi-Fi chip, so this is actually the source that makes the Wi-Fi network appear for all the people around the suit. Uh, we have a battery that uh, makes sure the power is fed through to the Wi-Fi. Um, and then we have the fabric itself, which has the copper yarn. So we use a copper like this, uh, which is really nice because it's a, it has a coating, so it will make sure that there's no short circuits in the fabric. Combining technology and textiles, that's what Ackersdijk strives for in his work. In this video that he produced himself, he explains his passion for futuristic apparel. And the young Dutch designer isn't the only one. Many other designers are pursuing a fascination with high-tech. Called intelligent fashion, it's been drawing increased attention the past few years. Well-known labels like Berlin-based Moon have been experimenting with integrating LED lights into fabric. And British designer Hussein Chalayan created skirts and dresses whose length can be altered with electronic commands. Research has played a major role in the development of high-tech designs. The electronic components have grown smaller and the clothes more flexible. I think the really the challenging part is standing next to the machine and Small things like okay, the copper thread needs to go into the machine, but it twists and the moment it twists it breaks, okay, how can we solve this? And then now the suit is finished, but can we wash it? No. So the suit isn't quite ready for daily wear. Not a problem for Ackersdijk. For him, fashion design is about playing with ideas. It's not that we want everybody to walk in this suit. That's definitely not the idea. Our goal for the future is like, to create a new platform and to see where uh, usability and user interface can go the moment you go away from the screen and on and around the body. 
With his high-tech overalls, Bora Ackersdijk has taken the first steps toward making that vision a reality. So, how many of you remember the 80s game called The Great Gianna Sisters? Well, this year it's back on the shelves, looking shiny, new and in line with modern day expectations. The Black Forest Games Company took a big risk in redeveloping the game for the modern market, but their efforts have paid off. It's attracted attention from around the world and also had two nominations for the German Computer Game Awards, which took place this last week. Gianna runs, jumps, flies and whirls through the world, or the imaginary world, in the computer game Gianna Sisters – Twisted Dreams. Just like a quarter of a century ago, Gianna has to fight through increasingly difficult levels, collecting diamonds and battling evil monsters to save her sister. The original version of this game now belongs to the software studio Black Forest Games from Offenborg. This new edition of Gianna Sisters is their first product, and it's already sold more than a million copies. It's actually really popular. You see more and more old titles being pulled out, reworked, and given a new look and feel. Developers have retained Gianna's trademark double personality. At the push of a button, she morphs from a lovable girl into an alter ego with a punk look and feel. That changes her abilities and her surroundings. Stefan Schmitz was responsible for adapting the old game into its modern form. He designed the individual levels. Two things were really important for us with Jana Sisters' Twisted Dreams. First, we wanted to stay true to the original and the feelings it evoked. And we also wanted to use it to realize our own interests and preferences. The original version of the game hit the market in 1987. But the German programmers were accused by Japanese company Nintendo of copyright infringement of its game, Super Mario Brothers. The Great Gianna Sisters was then taken off the market. But pirated copies continued to sell, making the game something of a cult favorite. Original versions can be bought on the internet for up to three and a half thousand euros. It's no coincidence that the Offenburg studio hit upon Gianna Sisters for its first project. One of the programmers of the original was a co-founder of Black Forest Games' predecessor. Back then, the company had 70 employees and plenty of success, with games such as Airline Tycoon and Desperados. But two years ago, investors pulled out and the firm went bust. A core team then acquired the rights to Gianna Sisters and founded Black Forest Games. The industry moves and changes so fast that we were always aware we were taking a big risk. But we also realized that this is what we really want to do. The founders of the Gianna Project began a crowdfunding campaign on the internet platform Kickstarter and more than 6,000 private individuals and fans invested some 135,000 euros in the game. For a studio like ours, it's an important story. And not just the financing. Maybe that was the case in the beginning. But now the funds you can get on Kickstarter have also dwindled. But it was great to test the interest in such a computer game early on before it's been developed. So you can quickly see whether your target audience is interested. Some of the original staff were rehired. Many could have made big money working outside the computer games industry, but the programmers, driven by their passion, stayed on and designed the game within 12 months. Even Chris Husbeck, the composer of the original game, is excited about his role. First of all, I think it's great that I could be part of this project, because the classic Genesis game was a milestone of my career. There are nine nationalities among the Black Forest Games employees. Many have become good friends and they often cook together at lunchtime. 
When we released Jana Sisters, the company grew as a team. The fear about whether the project would work actually brought us all together as a team. Black Forest Games will take the Kickstarter route again on their next project. But for now, the designers and programmers are busy enjoying the fantastic success of Jana Sisters' Twisted Dreams. And in complete contrast to the fantasy world, we take a look at the natural beauty of Jersey. This Channel Island belongs to the British Isles, but despite having pledged allegiance to the British Crown in 1066, it still makes its own laws and has its own fiscal system. The animal world is also very fond of this little island off the British coastline. The vista of sandy beaches framed by rough cliffs is typical of Jersey's coast. Here on the largest of the Channel Islands, the pace of life is leisurely. Overlooking the harbour of Gori is Montalgai Castle, a Jersey landmark. For centuries, the fortress was considered impregnable. Another historic spot is Vincent Obard's estate, Samara's Manor. It boasts one of the most diverse herb gardens in Europe. Some parts of the manor house are open to the public too. Along with the estate, Vincent Obard inherited the title of Signor, a feudal lord. The island is officially ruled by Elizabeth II, not in her capacity as Queen of Britain, but as head of the Duchy of Normandy, because Jersey is actually independent of Britain. A complicated situation, as even the Signor admits. He has to smile about some of his hereditary privileges. I used to have the right to shoot rabbits uh, on Mount Regent. Uh, my wife, if she uh, had a child, had the right to be taken to church for a churching ceremony uh, uh, on a horse to be provided by the priest. All these things are very obscure, but they are rights and privileges that were attached uh, to the manor. <laughs> The island is lush and green, thanks to frequent rain. But the climate is mild, an ideal combination for passionate gardeners like Judith Kerry. Organized chaos is what she calls her garden, which is open to visitors. I try to make the garden very natural, and so that we're very much um, thinking about the the environment that we live in and how it fits into the to the valley and also trying to cater really for the lots of bees and the different insects and the different birds. Despite the garden not being very large, it contains 2,500 different plants including numerous rare species. Judith Kerry's garden is indeed an award-winning attraction and so no wonder it's a popular place for tourists. Many of them even take a few gardening tips back home with them. The mild climate brought by the Gulf Stream makes Jersey a fertile island that also has a big appeal for gourmets. It's the original home of the Jersey cattle breed, known for high quality milk. It's an important ingredient at the Lamar wine estate. Chocolate maker Darren Stower concocts sweet edible treats like fudge and other delights made with pure Jersey cream. Among other culinary souvenirs at the estate's farm store is black butter, a spread made of apple cider and spices native to Jersey. Among the more exotic island dwellers are the golden lion tamarind monkeys at the Durrell Wildlife Park. This zoo focuses on rare, endangered and adorable species. It was founded more than 50 years ago and now boasts 132 species from across the world. Nowadays, guests can also spend the night in the park. Visitors sleep in comfortable tents with a safari feeling, a place to have sweet dreams of further adventures 
on the Channel Island of Jersey. And that is all we have time for today. So we'll hopefully see you again tomorrow for a brand new week of Euromax. But for now, from all of the team here, thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>